Um, well, welcome everyone uh, on behalf of the Association of Jewish Refugees, the AJR, and also the UK's delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or the IRA. Um, this is the first of three weekly discussions, panel discussions on broadly on the topic of teaching and learning about the Holocaust in the UK. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Alex Moss. I'm the head of educational grants and projects at the AJR and also um, part of my, my role uh, as it relates to today's event is I'm also a member of the UK delegation to the IRA, where I've been on the education working group there for about the past 10 years or so. Um, just a few quick uh, housekeeping details. So that, just to let you know the format of this, the event will last for an hour. It's, we have four excellent panelists who I will uh, introduce in just a few minutes. Uh, it will be an informal discussion amongst the panelists. We might have some time at the end uh, for questions from the audience, but um, sometimes the way these things work is that it, we just find ourselves um, running right up against uh, the, the, the time limit. So we'll do the best that we can. If not, we very much encourage everyone to uh, have a conversation uh, on Twitter. If you're a Twitter user, please do. You could use the uh, hashtag TLHUK, that's Teaching and Learning About the Holocaust, UK. Um, and I'll, I'll put up our, um, our Twitter handle in just a moment as well. Um, I, uh, I showed just a moment ago, let's see, our, uh, I mentioned our Twitter, you can see right there, we are at the AJR underscore and again the hashtag for this event is hashtag TLHUK. The Association of Jewish Refugees uh, was founded in 1941 and uh, so we're coming up on our 80th anniversary. We're primarily known for our social welfare programs uh, on behalf of our members but also we have part as part of our mission is to promote both education and remembrance about the Holocaust and the Nazi era, which is something that we do very much on behalf of our members in keeping with their wishes to preserve the legacy of their stories. Um, if you would like to learn more about our work, please, please do uh, visit our website at ajr.org.uk. Um, this event today, I think is probably as far as I know, the first event of its kind, um, where the members of the UK delegation to the IRA are joining together uh, to promote some of the work that we do. Um, over the course of the three sessions, we ha we'll have all of the organizations and, uh, and many of, most of the individuals who are delegates to the IRA from the UK will be participating in these, but we also wanted to bring in some people who aren't on the IRA delegation, um, just because this work is meant to impact the entire sector uh, across the UK, and so we wanted to have a lot of different perspectives on it. The IRA, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, is an intergovernmental network of 34 different member countries, plus some observer countries and, and partner organizations, all of whom join the IRA by signing up to something called the Stockholm Declaration, which is an affirmation of their commitment to ed Holocaust education, research, and remembrance. And it is a, a network that brings together people from government and experts in these various different fields um, to promote this shared agenda. In the UK, uh, probably the first time that many people ever heard of the IRA was about two years ago when there was uh, quite a public debate about the use of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. I'm very glad to know if there's any silver lining to that, it's that now people are probably more familiar with the IRA than they were before. And this, uh, this event is a good example of the breadth of IRA's work beyond just that one definition. In late 2019, uh, the IRA published this new set of educational recommendations, recommendations about teaching and learning about the Holocaust that we'll hear more about today. And we wanted to hold this event 
if for no other reason to let practitioners from across the sector know about this important new resource, but also because in that document, um, and we'll give you a link to it in just a second, in the AIM section, it says, these refreshed recommendations contribute to an ongoing conversation between academics, policymakers, practitioners, and wider society about the relevance and importance of teaching and learning about the Holocaust today. So um, rather than us doing a long presentation about the, the key points in those recommendations, we wanted to start that conversation. We wanted to have those recommendations be the springboard for this conversation. The title of today's session is what Holocaust education is and isn't. And um, observant folks might have noticed in the title that the, uh, the term Holocaust education is in quotation marks. Um, why is that? In 2017, the IRA published findings of its global research project about the state of Holocaust education. Um, and in those recommendations was a suggestion that we use the term teaching and learning about the Holocaust instead of Holocaust education. So that's where the title of this uh, three-week symposium comes from. Um, I think it's not just a matter of semantics about which, phrase, which words or phrases we use. I think that the point of that suggestion is that Holocaust education means a lot of different things to different people. Um, last year at JW3 here in London, there was an event, and I noticed uh, my colleague Michelle Heyer is, is here today, which is, which is great to continue that conversation. And their event was called, Has Holocaust Education Failed? And it was actually a fantastic collection of voices, similar to what we're trying to do here. But I think it, it was asking the wrong question. Um, if I asked each of you here today to write on a piece of paper what you think Holocaust education is or what it aims to do, I suspect we would have 200 or so different responses. Um, is it a straightforward transmission of historical facts? Is it actually a historical topic at all? Or is it something more interdisciplinary? Is it a process that involves using the Holocaust as a useful case study? to highlight a range of different universal issues? If so, which issues? Ones that are specific to genocide and fascism or specific to European Jews or more broadly about tolerance towards all people no matter what. If you um, look at the mission statements of different Holocaust educational organizations, you will see lots of these different perspectives are represented. So I don't even think necessarily in our field there is there is necessarily agreement. You might have seen um, in, in the news, I don't know if you also have a Google search for anything related to the Holocaust. Maybe it's just people like me that do that. But there was a law passed in uh, the United States last week, and we'll hear uh, from a colleague from the US who, who um, might, might have views on this later, but um, President Trump signed into law something called the Never Again Education Act, which uh, it, requires and promotes Holocaust education across the country. And it was noteworthy for its broad support in both parties, Republicans and Democrats there. And um, it's nice to see that people of different perspectives are all voting for it. And I'm sure they had good intentions, but I do wonder if they had the same intentions. Could those people who say on one side believe that there are fine people on both sides of a white nationalist rally actually think that Holocaust education means the same thing to those people who compared uh, immig immigrant detention camps to Nazi camps. Both of those recent public events highlight the need for more Holocaust education, but probably for very different reasons. So to improve what we call Holocaust education or teaching and learning about the Holocaust, let's start to try to understand what it is or what it isn't, or maybe what it should be or what it shouldn't be. And um, I'm really pleased to introduce our panel today. So joining us, we have Jennifer Chardelli, from, who is the director uh, for the Initiative on the Holocaust and Professional Leadership at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, Jennifer is joining us today in part because um, she is just a fascinating person with great expertise on this topic, but also in her capacity as a member of the uh, United States delegation to the IRA, she chaired the committee that created these new guidelines, uh, or recommendations, I should say, on teaching and learning about the Holocaust. 
Kat Kirkland is here from the Holocaust Educational Trust, where she's an education officer. Ruth Ann Lenga is the program director and principal teaching fellow at the UCL Center for Holocaust Education. And Alistair Richardson is the senior lecturer in education in the Institute of Education at the University of Winchester. And there his research focuses on young people's emotional engagement with learning about the Holocaust. So welcome to our panel. And I want to start by asking each panelist a um, sort of a direct question, and then we'll open it up to a broader discussion. And my first one, I think, will be to Ruth Ann Lenga from the UCL Center for Holocaust Education. Um, so Ruth Ann, do you think that these, uh, oh, sorry, no, the first, sorry, I've got that wrong. I wanted to start actually with Jen Chardelli. Sorry about that, because um, she should give us a background on the, the recommendations themselves. Now, there, I've unmuted you. Um, so actually, Jen, can you tell us a little bit, before we get into the conversation, it would be useful for people to know about these IRA recommendations. Uh, how did the project come about? And can you maybe give us a brief synopsis of what they cover? Yes, great. Thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you to the AJR for hosting this and bringing us all together. I think in these challenging times, it's just nice to see familiar faces and, and, and um, folks gathering for so good conversation about important stuff. Um, so in terms of the IRA recommendations for teaching and learning about the Holocaust, um, as Alex mentioned, this intergovernmental alliance um, is focused on education, memory, and research. And in 20 years ago, when it was created, had a body of guidelines, um, which is not unfamiliar, right? Many of our organizations and institutions also have a sense of guidelines. One of the things that I think is exciting about these IRA recommendations is the, the point that Alex made is that the IRA consists of members from 34 different countries. So um, in the education working group, there had been conversations about a need to refresh the existing guidelines, even though they were incredibly sound when they were created, times change, right? The internet has brought in a whole new world of messaging and factual and unfactual information. Um, Anti-Semitism continues to rise in the most recent years, challenges with um, white supremacy, right? All of these dynamics, um, it seemed to suggest that it would be worth our while to revisit and refresh and the 2017 research project that Alex mentioned. So how could we um, refresh based on best practice and the most current research? So um, the core team um, consisted of representatives from eight different countries. And we did a teacher focus group, for example, that had representatives from eight more countries. And I mentioned that only because when we're talking about are there common concepts of what it means to teach and learn about the Holocaust? very diversity of this multinational um, group that helped to think and create this together, I think is a resounding complement to some unity in our field. Um, so the aims of the recommendations, just in brief, and you just saw a link where you can download the whole piece online. Of course, first off, it's to develop knowledge about the Holocaust that's accurate, um, that also raises an awareness of, and the, of the consequences of anti-Semitism. Um, we wanted to really promote um, teaching models or methods that are engaging. Um, we wanted to promote critical and reflective thinking for learners. And we also wanted to contribute and try to better articulate the relationship between teaching and learning about the Holocaust with the fields of human rights and genocide prevention. Um, we, uh, this started in 2017. There was work, um, iterative work throughout 2018, a mad rush of work in 2019. By the end, all of the IRA delegation, which is over, I guess like 250 members, maybe 300, were invited to weigh in on this. So it really was a whole of um, practitioner and diplomat work. Um, in terms of the recommendations themselves, they are divided, as originally, they were divided into three categories. So why teach about the Holocaust, what to teach, and how to teach. I'm gonna give you just a quick overview of each of those three sections in terms of what was new or what we saw as new in this refresh. Um, and then we'll, we can go on to conversation. I can answer other questions. But in terms of the why, that's the rationale, right? We wanted to really refresh the multiple points of entry that educators could use to unpack the how and why in the ho of the Holocaust. And so in this, we were emphasizing how to counter anti-Semitism. That was um, kind of re-emphasized. We wanted to make sure that there was language about unpacking and analyzing the role of ordinary people, which is research that has emerged more recently, even since the first guidelines were created. 
we wanted to emphasize um, a critical interpretation of po uh, popular and cultural manifestations of, of the Holocaust um, used for different means um, to try and enable learners to be more critical, um, to minimize the risk of manipulation. And the why also um, articulates the idea of conceiving of events as iterative, as a process that Auschwitz um, didn't just pop out of nowhere. You have to go back and understand the process of events to get there. So you can look online in the document yourself to see more about the why, but those were some of the elements that we thought were, were important for 2020. Um, the what section, one of the key things that's new about it is it is framed by questions. And what we wanted to do there was not just identify the what in terms of names and dates, which are absolutely essential, but must be framed in a context of inquiry, right? Thinking about um, a dynamic process of engagement. So one of the examples, there are four key questions that frame the what section. Um, one of them, for example, is how did Jews respond to persecution and mass murder? Um, you can check out the resource to see some more. Um, and then there are a series of questions that educators can use to frame their study. Some of them might be too nuanced. I think there would be too nuanced to use them straight out, depending on your, your student population. But it was meant to, um, to reinforce and encourage an environment of inquiry um, rather than just a recitation of facts. Um, the final section is the, is, the, um, is the longest section. It's how to teach. And it, this is based on um, what we understand to be best practical experience, which again, we were able to garner that from the broad membership of the, of the folks thinking about this, but also the research that was out there, some of which informed by the 2017 IBRA Research Project. Um, and it uh, advises on how best to engage learners in what is or can be a really challenging and nuanced topic to unpack. Um, an example of something that's new here, again, is um, in section 3.25, there's a, an emphasis on how to unpack the complicated nature of roles that people play. Somebody who's a, uh, a, a perpetrator might actually be a rescuer in another moment, could even be a victim, right? It gets complicated. And so how do you engage that without engage in that without overwhelming people um, is something new. I think, again, that's emerged in the field. Um, and another example is the encouraging um, study at the local, um, regional, national, and even global level. Um, even though we've got these recommendations, we do recognize that not one size fits all and that people need to really think about what is important in their local context that can um, create relevance, even as they think about um, the broader trends that actually you know, create the unity and make this a relevant topic for many of us. So I think I will stop there and, um, and answer questions or, or speak more as it comes up. That's great. Thank you so much, Jen. And I want to sort of pivot from the, the what's on the page um and then and also what is international to look at what happens sort of in practice uh on the ground in the classroom and specifically here in the uk and for that i wanted to turn to ruth ann langer from the ucl center for holocaust education and ruth ann i wanted to ask you do you think that these ira recommendations that have recently been published meet the needs and the concerns of teachers? Do, you, do they acknowledge or do they help to address some of the issues that are raised in the, the research that I know that you've conducted at UCL? Uh, absolutely. I, I think they certainly go a long way uh, to, to address some of the critical uh, issues that we found in our 2009 research report with teachers um, and also our 2016 uh, inquiry um, with um, nearly 8,000 8, to 9,000 actually um, young people between the ages of 11 and 18 that we conducted. But before I start and just identify some of those things, I do want to commend uh, Ira um, and uh, everybody involved in producing the recommendations because I think they, they are truly fantastic and um, they, they really are going to support teachers and teachers are going to need that support and that, that's something we really do realize. And I also want to commend um, AJR for putting this on right now, um, particularly because because um, at UCL, we've been delighted to discover that uh, even during this pandemic, teachers 
uh, who are trying to teach their classes of 30 online from their kitchen tables with dodgy Wi-Fi are actually still teaching about the Holocaust uh, with all its complexity, all its demands, all its emotional heavyweight, we still are hearing feedback from our teachers' networks that yes, they're still pursuing it. And, and I think that's absolutely fantastic. So to have these recommendations, to have this forum now is, is, is wonderful and very, very timely um, and really needed So and much appreciated. So back to the question. Well, yes, I, I think in many ways it does. And, and, and first of all, I, one of the things that, that is really appealing is that the recommendation document does begin with, with its title of being teaching and learning about the Holocaust as opposed to Holocaust education for some of the reasons um, that Alex uh, put forward in the beginning of its amorphous and, and ill-defined perhaps um, definition uh, that nobody quite knows what we're actually talking about in Holocaust education. Is it with a lower E or a capital E? Does that make a difference? So teaching and learning about the Holocaust perhaps is much more clearer about the what, the where, the why, the how, and are we achieving our goals when we teach uh, and when we learn about the Holocaust. So I think that's a refreshing change. So thank you, Jennifer, uh, for that. The second thing is it's really, um, it's really um, encouraging that it, it didn't go down the line, which I, I understand is tempting, to give us a do's and don'ts in Holocaust, mm -hmm. in teaching about the Holocaust. Don't do this, don't do that. It isn't the tone and the manner in which it's, uh, the recommendations are put across are sort of respectful of the teacher's craft and the teacher's skill and decision uh, and, and understanding of their own students and education and what young people at 14 can grapple with. Um, so, so I like that. The, second, the, the third thing is, is this inquiry based approach, which I think is um, a really uh, open and an investigative way of looking at uh, and inquiring about the Holocaust. So that whole tone is about what we can discover, what we can grapple with, what we wrestle with, what we can glean, what we can learn, and from an informed position, what meanings we can make, what possible meanings we can glean from this. So I like that. The other thing that I think is critical is, is this aspect of complexity. Um, I think from, our, from both research projects, we were concerned that perhaps young people are coming away with a rather limited, simplistic understanding of deeply complex things. And perhaps there's a perception that maybe young people can't uh, reach to those complex ideas. But I think what the recommendations are really encouraging teachers to do is to not be afraid to teach. In fact, it actually says, don't be afraid to, to, to grapple with this. Don't be afraid. Your young people can work with it. Follow some guidelines, follow these recommendations. Um, and, and it's possible to unpack some of the complexities. The complexity, complexity for instance, that um, it's not a simple perpetration here. Um, we found in our research uh, when we uh, surveyed young people that 50.7% of all students across all year groups appeared to believe that the Holocaust was solely attributed to Hitler. And 20% we're also thinking it was Hitler and other Nazis. So there is a simplistic idea that perhaps there's just one perpetra perpetrator in this crime, when actually the far more profound and deep rooted meaningful educational understanding is just, the com is just how complicit uh, people were to, to this crime and how, as Jennifer has put across, the ideas of bystander, collaborator, perpetrator, they're not clear-cut, uh, simple ideas. They're fluid. You could be both. You could be a raging anti-Semite, but you could rescue somebody. 
And young people, I think, are able to grasp this. We need to scaffold it and we need to help, but they can reach it. They have to reach it um, because that is what Holocaust, do teaching about, learning about the Holocaust should be about, trying to engage with that complexity. Um, and then the important thing about the local context that Jennifer spoke about. We found, for instance, that young people had a very limited uh, uh, understanding, for instance, of Britain's role in the Holocaust. Um, many feeling that uh, Britain, that's why Britain went to war to rescue the Jews in the Holocaust, uh, or that, uh, that the British government didn't know what was going on with the, with, with the Jews in, in, in Europe. And so it's very important, I think, that uh, young people do get a grasp of their own countries and their national um, role and how that their country is dealing with coming to terms with the past mm -hmm. and, um, and recording that narrative. So those are some of the important things. And um, crucially as well, and, and, and I think the recommendations highlight it uh, to, to an extent, is, is the importance of uh, helping young people learn about who are, the, who were the Jewish people. Um, again, we found that uh, young people had a very limited understanding of who the Jewish people are, were, and, and were clinging on to misconceptions. And when you look at some of the textbooks that are in our classrooms, um, one can perhaps understand why um, some of these ideas, where they're, where, where, you know, where they're reinforced, um, because we, we've done other research with textbooks and we can see problems there that are, you know, apart from inaccuracies and things like that, but the portray, portrait of Jewish people isn't a human one. It isn't humanizing uh, the, the Jewish people. So images of Jews, often in these textbooks, which are about five pages in a history book, focus on Nazi propaganda, stereotype cartoons, and then some perpetrator narrative, and then large pictures of dead bodies coming out of the crematoria. So I think what's coming out of the recommendations is the need to humanize history and to, 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 to do uh, um, studies beforehand about who the Jewish people are, the long history of anti-Semitism is crucial. And um, so we, we feel very much that the recommendations do touch on those critical things. And also um, do some, offer some good advice on how to teach the Holocaust, but perhaps that's something uh, we talk about a bit later. Alex, you've muted yourself. I said something really brilliant and you've all missed it. Um, I just said, thank you, Ruthann. It's great to, um, to know that this internationally produced uh, set of recommendations aligns with what the research that you've done here specifically in England um, and that, you know, that there's a lot of, uh, of relevance to the actual experiences of teachers in, in this country as well. Now, um, Ruthann, it's a, it was a nice segue point there that you talked about humanizing, because I do feel like the, what sometimes gets neglected in these discussions is the human dimension of learning. And I think this is a good uh, opportunity to bring in Alistair Richardson from University of Winchester, because Alistair, this is your, really your area of of expertise and research is about how young people actually engage on an emotional level. And I was heartened and I wonder, you know, if you would feel the same that under the how to teach section of these new recommendations, one point reads, be responsive to the background emotions and concerns of the learners. Um, were you pleased to see this included in the recommendations? Uh, or, and or, I should say, does this one line in there raise a whole host of other questions that we should be thinking of? Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I, 
and um, thank you for for hosting today and, and inviting me um i mean absolutely i I'm, I'm in general really pleased to see that, that there's a recognition here about being responsive to the background emotions and concerns of learners um and i think that's quite a, an interesting phrase in quite a, in a very significant document um i'd like to unpick that a little bit um so one of the resources that the Holocaust Educational Trust has looks at the mosaic of victims. And I think, as Ruth Ann said, that complexity is really important that we look at different victims and, and different stories. But equally, that we look at a mosaic and a complexity of students and their backgrounds and where they're coming from. Because we, when we're talking about Holocaust education or, or learning about the Holocaust, um, we're really looking at two things. One being what do we receive, as in what is that knowledge base? Um, what do we want children and young people to learn? And I know that's something we'll, we'll look at later on. But particularly from this statement, I'd like to unpick a little bit about how do they receive that information? What's that process as, as young people absorb this information? So picking up on the, the three things that are in that statement, the background, emotions and concerns, um, I think it's really important that teachers and I've only been in the university setting for a few years, I was a teacher for a long time before that, teachers consider the background of where their students are coming from. So it might be things, for example, like their own family history, uh, whether that has a connection to the Holocaust or not, it's, it's just their, their family history, where they've, where they've come from, what their, their background story is. For example, there might be a refugee family and there may be particular strands of the story of the Holocaust and that narrative that resonate with them in a particular way and, and often I will talk to my trainee teachers about the definition of a sensitive issue being something that poses a threat to you you know it, it encroaches upon your own personal narrative in some way um, the Centre for Holocaust Education's original research 10 years ago picked up that the group that uh, teachers are most concerned about when teaching are um, German heritage children, so children who possibly have a perpetrator heritage somewhere in their own background. Um, we might want to think about their religious background as well. For example, a student that comes from a Jewish family might have a particular perspective um, on learning about the Holocaust. Um, or a student who identifies in some way perhaps with this label maybe of being a third generation survivor and what that means to them. And you know, for, for a lot of students, they, they pick up these labels as they encounter them in the classroom. It may be something that I haven't thought about before. And certainly I can think of a, an occasion where I taught one class of 13 year olds, whereas the, as the couple of weeks went on, different students were coming in and saying, I've had a conversation at home and mum was telling me about this or, or dad started talking about that. And, and so their narratives actually change over time. Um, I think particularly at the moment when we're looking in the media, we're looking at things like the, the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a lot there as well that, that students will come in and will be having discussions around difference and, and their feelings of where they fit in society and how society reacts to different groups. Um, and also we need to think in terms of background about their prior learning. Quite simply, when they're in our classroom, what have they learned before? And that might be very different. It could range from an awful lot, both in school and at home. To, to virtually nothing. I think the point about emotion is really important. I think certainly learning about the Holocaust can stir really strong emotions. Um, Sternstrom referred to it as a tarnished mirror of history, so it's in some respect we, we, we reflect on our own histories when we learn about the Holocaust. Um, and this may seem quite a strange thing for a teacher to say, but to some extent, I think when we're learning about the Holocaust, to some extent, we need to start at the lowest common denominator, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, because if we start too far on, there'll be students in our classroom who don't know what we're talking about. You know, you need to start from, from where the young people are in terms of their learning from, from the lowest point to be able to get them towards an understanding that is developing later on. Um, in some respects, that I'm kind of making a call, I guess, for some sort of slow pedagogy when it comes to learning about the Holocaust, that this is something that can't be rushed according to the demands of our mm -hmm. scheme of work, that we need to start where the children are and go at the pace that the children are at, not necessarily achieve everything that's set out in our scheme of work just because it says so. Um, because fundamentally, we need to be really careful that we're not traumatising young people. Yeah, that they don't make the academic retreat, they don't just go back to the, to the facts and ignore the feelings because um, that's the easiest thing to do, um, or that they don't switch off from it completely. And I, I know a number of people whose children have done that and said, you know, I, I don't want to talk about what we learned at school today, um, because they, they just internalise it and they, they can't express it. 
and on the other end of that we need to make sure that children aren't sort of over interested and, and titillated by what they're seeing and, and have a sort of a morbid fascination in what they're learning about it's fundamentally i would say to teachers if, if you look at a resource and think should i be using this resource that the answer is probably no um, if you're having that debate about is this appropriate or not um, and I know the USC Shoah Foundation have often referred to their online testimony archive as being a walled garden. Um, and I think that's particularly important. That's always how I viewed my own classroom when I'm teaching about the Holocaust as being a walled garden. And I think there are issues there that we might explore later on around how you wall that garden in a pandemic. Um, and I know that uh, people like the USC, um, like the UCL Centre for Holocaust Education and Holocaust Educational Trust have very carefully curated resources um, that enable that wall garden to still happen when the resource is being used out in the world without a, a teacher or a professional in front of the, the children. The third point about concerns, I think, is really important with, with young people having concerns. What space do we give them? You know, I think from my own research, one thing that I've found is that young people very rarely get the chance to sit and talk about how they feel about what they have learned. You know, what do I do with this information? I'm a teenager. You're, you're talking to me about genocide. You're talking to me about mass murder. And I don't know what to do with that information. And that's not unreasonable because I'm a little bit older than a teenager and I don't know what to do with that information. Do we give them the space to be able to talk about these things? And sometimes that might not be at the end of the lesson. That might be a month later. Yeah. It might be a couple of years later. And you know, our curriculum works that we sort of we do something and we move on to the next thing or they don't take that subject next year. Um, and it really worries me that we don't sort of have this joined up approach very often, because I think, I think most of the panel would agree that the best way of achieving that is, is, is A, by, by being a human being with the, the class that are in front of you. So, you know, if you're, if you're teaching and you're learning about the Holocaust doesn't fit with your scheme of work or your knowledge organiser or um, Ofsted inspecting your school or whoever it might be, or, or your exam specification, then, then so be it. You know, if it doesn't fit with that criteria, then then fine. Because I think the key thing in this sentence that, that you pulled out of the um, IRA document is be responsive to the background emotions and concerns of the learners. Mm. And that that is both be responsive at the start, but also be responsive yeah. during, you know, because young people will reveal things. They will talk to you. They will want to talk about things or not talk about things. And as teachers, you know, I'm a huge shout out to all the teachers at the moment who are doing what they're doing. Teachers are expert professionals in this. We're, we're good at being in a classroom and being able to respond to the needs of our students and knowing our students. And again, UCL research suggests that teachers tend to leave this topic until later in the year mm -hmm. so that they form those relationships with students so that they're able to have a relationship where they know the student well, the student can trust them when they're dealing with this potentially very difficult material yeah so I, I think you know sorry no I, I it's 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 very useful to hear that although it complicates the picture that the concept of whether we're calling it holocaust education or teaching and learning about the holocaust that it's not just a series of boxes that you take that relate to specific kinds of content but that pedagogy by definition needs to you know include this this emotional uh, this concern for the emotional well-being of the learners because other those two things go together you can't you know how you learn depends on the emotional state of the learners and, yeah and so. yeah absolutely i mean i've always quite flippantly said no one's been traumatized by a math lesson i think they possibly have yeah, I but you know yeah. there's, there's more to it it's different and i think for me, I would always advocate a cross-curricular approach because, for example, your pastoral staff in school, your religious education teachers, your right. citizenship PSHE teachers, we get quite territorial about who owns the Holocaust sometimes in schools, I think, and where it should sit and who should be teaching it. Um, and I think, you know, as Ruth Ann said, we're, we're trying to make complexity. We're trying to problematise the subject here. Um, mm young people are never going to understand what we're trying to teach them because I don't fully understand. You can't fully understand the Holocaust. What we're trying to do is guide them towards an understanding. Um, and that takes more than a small, concise set of lessons. And I, I think that's possibly something that Kat's about to talk to. Yeah. Well, let, let me, let me bring Kat in. And actually it's, it's useful because uh, we, I'm trying to man our, our, um, comments in the chats here and then also looking on Twitter where people are, are live tweeting things. So thank you to everyone who's doing that. But um, two comments that came in, one uh, from uh, Jamie was about 
uh, just the lack of time. Another person asked a question about, um, I think it was Joanna said, are we trying to cover too much material? And I think that brings us to this question of the, the, the practicalities. Um, Kat, I know that uh, the Holocaust Educational Trust, where you're an education officer, very much emphasizes the IRA recommendations in its various resources and its courses for students and for teachers. Um, but there, there is a practical challenge in all of this, which is the amount of time um, that teachers actually have to teach about the Holocaust and all of these other boxes. In, in your experience, how possible is it really for for teachers or, or their, the schools that are, the departments that are setting the, the uh, scheme of work to, to tick all those boxes? Is it realistic? <laughs> um, well, first of all, thanks Alex and ADR for inviting me on behalf of the Trust to come and speak. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Um, the recommendations describe the Holocaust as this broad expanse, this, in, in, yeah, this, this enormous series of events taking place on this huge, scale um, and understanding it involves discussions of these great big pieces of history. Um, and as uh, Ruth Ann has alluded to, research from 2009 suggested most teachers get a handful of lessons to discuss this topic. But what I think is interesting about, about the way you, in which you, you asked that question is you are very specifically pluralizing um, both teachers and schools. And I think it's really worth us highlighting that it's not up to a single teacher to, te uh, to organize all of the teaching and learning for any one student about the Holocaust. Um, if effective teaching and learning involves progression and recognizing that students can engage with different sorts of ideas and different challenging concepts at different ages, and if we um, use a spiral curriculum, then we can engage students in different types of discussions as they grow older, um, and we can ensure that it's not up to, to a single teacher to be responsible for all of that student's uh, learning about the Holocaust. So at the Trust, as, as many of you will know, we have provided um, two schemes of work, one which is designed for pupils who are in primary school, um, which looks at pre-war Jewish life, the anti-Jewish laws and the kinder transport, and the kinder transport focus um, lessons focus on the story of Vera Schofield, who I believe is, uh, is watching this afternoon, which is great. Um, they don't take the students into a study of the Holocaust itself, but they provide an excellent context for the students to pick up those stories and elements of them when they reach secondary school. One of the recommendations in the, um, the new document highlights the importance of interdisciplinary learning and we encourage that in our secondary scheme of work which is framed around cross-curricular approaches to teaching about the Holocaust. So a series of lessons which teachers of different subject areas, particularly um, RE, history and citizenship, can dip into and teach according to both their own strengths but also to where the topic fits within their own curriculum. And we have additional opportunities for teachers um, of, in, uh, of English and art and drama also to teach about the topic through their own specialisms. So ideally in a school, a student might be taught by many different teachers who are teaching different elements of either the Holocaust or the ways in which it can be understood in different subject areas. But of course, this is entirely dependent on collaborative planning and teachers being able to communicate together or with each other and plan together, which is another challenge. Um, and of course, our providing resources doesn't necessarily resolve the greater challenge of how much time it takes to explore such a, a challenging topic. So you asked about my, my experience and um, my, my greatest uh, pleasure at the moment in my, in my job is, is speaking to teachers and about their experiences of teaching and, and what works well for them. And there's really three common themes in how those teachers are able to, to, to teach in a way that they feel is effective, um, not just in their own classrooms, but also to lead teaching about the Holocaust within their own schools. Um, particularly teachers who take part in our annual teacher training course in Yad Vashem, speak really highly of their colleagues and the ways in which they are working together. And there seems to be three common themes in, in enabling teachers to tick all the right boxes by working together and, and covering this, uh, this broad expanse but in useful ways according to different subjects. The first is that um, there's a member of senior leadership who has in some ways sort of bought in, for want of a better phrase, into the idea that this is important. 
So if there is somebody in a position of leadership in the school generally who has acknowledged the importance of teaching about the Holocaust, but also recognises that it needs to be done, to use Alistair's terms, in insensitive ways, um, then that enables teachers to, to work more effectively. A second element uh, that they've suggested is really important is having someone in a position of leadership who is coordinating the teaching and learning about the Holocaust. It's not necessarily somebody with senior leadership experience, but rather somebody who might be a classroom teacher or a head of department or have other responsibilities, but is there in a coordinating capacity. So perhaps it's someone, and we've worked with teachers in both of these positions, who have um, leading teaching and learning about the Holocaust as part of their job description or have it as a performance management target. So a member of staff who then can oversee what's happening in the different subject areas, encouraging those teachers to speak to each other. And then the final aspect of, of what seems to work is when teachers have appropriate CPD, when they have training. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I don't remember who it was who was talking about this. I think it was possibly Ruth Ann who, who mentioned you know, teachers being a little bit fearful of teaching about the Holocaust and in case they do it wrong um, and that that can put some teachers off doing it at all. Um, but with useful CPD, um, they, uh, yeah, teachers can feel much more empowered to deal with this, this challenging topic and to also support their colleagues in doing so too. So yeah, it, it is challenging to, to uh, tick all of those boxes. The, the, the Holocaust is, is huge, it's incredibly sensitive and it's incredibly complex. Um, but uh, we do work with teachers who manage to navigate those, those challenges using resources that allow for progression and working together with this interdisciplinary or cross-curricular approach to, to teaching about the Holocaust at different times. That's great. Thank you so much, Kat. I, I want to um, I want to sort of, of course, I, I assumed we were going to have much more time to get it. I have a whole list of questions that we probably uh, will we'll barely scratch the surface of, but I do want to um, to sort of dig a little deeper on this, the question at the t in the title of this event, which is what Holocaust education is and isn't. One of the common things, and Jen, I'm going to try and I'm going to pick on you first, only because you um, were the chair of the committee that produced these recommendations. If you don't have loads to say, it's it's totally fine. But we'll we'll see if others do as well. But one one of the um, questions that often comes up in our field is what should the role of quote lessons? And I'm again doing exaggerated uh, speech quotes there. It's worth noting that the IRA recommendations actually barely mention the idea of lessons that are sort of intended to be part and parcel of teaching and learning about the Holocaust. There is one bit in a section under human rights education, so how uh, learning about the Holocaust can be incorporated or go alongside learning about human rights, and it says a clear distinction should be made between the Holocaust and the lessons that can be drawn from it. The past occurred in a particular way for particular reasons, and oversimplification of historical facts or broader concepts to emphasize particular, quote, lessons serves neither learners nor educators. Educators should be especially cautious in imposing contemporary knowledge or values on those in the past. So I guess, Jen, the first question is, you know, why did you feel the need to put that in there? And do you have any other comments about that just from your own experience? Yeah, am I? You're on. Thank you. Um, no, I think that it goes back to, I mean, the title of this course and what Ruth Ann was saying about what Holocaust education, and it means so many different things to many people. And I think that phrase actually captures what the spirit of the group thought, which was, we really need to maintain the integrity of this historical moment. There was nothing like it before and nothing like it after in terms of its specificity, its time, the way it specifically unfolded. And I think what we do in an educational realm is unpack that experience. And because we're humans, um, we bring to it our, our relevance and we think about meaning based on the things that are going on around us. But I, I think it's dangerous if it, if it, I mean, I think this is what we were thinking. It's dangerous if an educator enters it trying to teach a specific lesson, right? We teach the history and by being responsive to the students and engaging, I mean, the power of well-told history, Holocaust history, is that it sparks conversations and discussions and reflections that get to the heart of what it means to be human and what it means to function in or out of a human society. And so how do we create space based on the historical integrity of what we know and the testimonies? Um, how do we allow that to create the space 
for honest um, response and honest grappling with the complexity of this history. I think that's what we were trying to um, help frame out. I really like the way you said that, that it's, it, it highlights what it means to be human. And that encompasses all manner of different things. There's not one specific lesson, but obviously if you, if you learn about the Holocaust, it would be almost impossible not to derive something a bit more than just about that history from it. But that, it sounds like uh, what you are saying is that that's not necessarily the responsibility of the teacher from the outset to decide what that what specific lesson it's going to be. Is that I, fair to say? I, I think so. And I think in our programming at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, there's also an element. I mean, we, everybody talks a lot about relevance, but how do you draw from the resources and put the stories out there so that people can respond in honest ways? And going back to what Alistair was saying about the background of our students, I mean, people come with such complex backgrounds. We, it, 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 I think we just I, I, I obtain more fruitful conversations when we acknowledge that people will bring to it their thinking. And if we create space for that, then we can really create a vibrant space for conversation and dialogue. Just did any of our other panelists want to comment on this concept of lessons? Okay, so maybe just briefly, because I, I there are a couple other questions I do want to get to. So Kat and then Ruth Ann. Um, yeah, so um, our flagship program is called Lessons from Auschwitz. And Unhelpfully. It's difficult to, to, to not comment on this, this issue of of, of lessons, I think one of the things that's really significant in the program is that as much as we have very clear uh, notions of what historical understandings we would expect our participants to take from the project, one of the very first things we do as soon as we meet the participants is to deconstruct this term lessons and effectively say we, we, we don't have a simple answer for what these lessons are. One of the ways that we can elicit from the students what lessons if we want to use that term, they took from the program is through the, the writing that they do after they've completed the project, which can um, be incredibly personally reflective. And it's perhaps through their discussions of how they've appreciated more about the nature of anti-Semitism, or they feel more empowered to challenge it. Or in some cases, I've read students who've written, um, and this is almost a direct quotation, cereal tastes better now, and I'm just much more appreciative of the fact I have enough food. And for that person, that notion of compassion and appreciating the experiences of others is a lesson they've taken from the project. Now, we can't organise a programme around asking people to appreciate their breakfast. That's not what learning is. But I think the term lessons for us can then become something that is really useful for describing the personal reflections and, and the personal meaning that students might take from studying something for which our historical learning outcomes might be a little bit more explicit. Great. Thank you. And Ruth Ann. Uh, just just a quick comment, really. Um, um, I think there's a fear or there's an association with an idea of a pre-packaged answer or a pre-packaged lesson um, with the Holocaust, which um, uh, people can uh, might think they impose upon young people. And that's not what I think uh, we're, we're talking about here. And Jennifer uh, articulated very well that perhaps through this history uh, with it and, and exploring it with integrity one may well come toward uh, looking toward uh, questions about what it means to be human which which possibly is what education is anyway um, uh, Holocaust and education it's like an oxymoron isn't it one is the darkest of, of, of knowledge and the other education has this spirit of uh, hope, of growth, of renewal, of moving forward, of uh, survival. Um, and, and I think that can't be prepackaged because human being to human being, whether 14 year old or a teacher, we all come with our knowledge, our experience of life, and very often our 14 year olds are coming to our classrooms with far more life experience and hard knocks than us standing at the front. And, and it's, it's an amalgamation of who you are, what you've learned, how experience the process, and also the relationship you've had with your peers and your teacher in, in encountering this period of history. Um, which will result in, in, in you attempting perhaps to, to build some sort of meaning, to find your own lesson, if you like. But it isn't yeah. something prepackaged. And in, in, at UCL, 
we work with a concept, a pedagogic concept, which we're always trying to better improve and, and nuance of authentic encounter. And we, we remind ourselves, we name our, our sessions and, and we talk about authentic encounter in every respect, whether it's the way we, we work with young people in an authentic way, whether it's the way we handle testimony, with, where we handle our, our primary source ma material, the way we engage with a Holocaust survivor. Um, we try to always think about an authenticity rather than anything which is imposed and anything prepackaged. Right. And I think that's the association we it's, have with the idea of lesson. You, you, you made such a good point about the continually sort of uh, improving your offering. And I think that that applies n not just to your center, which does tremendous work, but I think to the entire field of teaching and learning about the Holocaust, it's important for people to know that this is not um, something that someone's, you could put a pin in and it's always been the same and always will be the same you know you and i i've been in this field for 20 years almost and it you know our understanding of good practice is very different now than it was then and that's a good thing because of people like you because of people like alistair you know the work that jen and kat are doing at their centers you know to in constantly improve our understanding of what works what doesn't and as history itself, new, new information is constantly being revealed to us and we need to adapt to that. I'm getting so many interesting co comments here uh, in the chat function. I, I'm afraid I don't have time for all of them. I did want to um, say, let's see. So Fran up in Manchester asked if there would be any discussion about learning outside the classroom. And I'm very pleased to say that yes, next week we will be um, having a separate panel on Britain's Holocaust uh, muse museums, memorials and archives um and there and so i if you haven't already signed up for that one you know please please do i hope we can very much continue this conversation i did want to um just maybe just go back for one final question or comment is there anything you know we're talking about all this list of things that holocaust education or ideally we might start saying teaching and learning about the holocaust should be is there any, do any of you have pet peeves about what it shouldn't be? Or that was also in the title of this. Alistair, just because you haven't had a chance to talk in for a minute, sorry to put you on the spot. Is there anything in your experience as an educator, in addition to being a researcher that you've come across that you think, I just wish more people understood that's not what we're, we should be aiming to do? Yeah, I think, I mean, if I can just draw a kind of a, kind of bridges this question and the last question, I put something on Twitter this morning about a national commentator at the moment talking about um, the removal of historically problematic mm. statues in the UK. And yesterday, a member of parliament talked about Auschwitz being in Germany as a reminder to Germany. And people were very quick to point out that it is not in Germany. It is currently within, within the borders of what is currently Poland. And that that's very problematic. Um, but this particular national newspaper, um, the commentator wrote, for as long as Auschwitz remains standing, for example, we'll never forget the genocide of World War II, and rightly so. Slavery is in that same category. And I just think there's so much wrong with this misconception about even you know, that Auschwitz remains standing. Auschwitz is a historical place. It isn't a place that exists today that we can go to. It's a place in the past. There is a museum there. The museum itself describes itself as being in the post-camp space. You know, so when we talk about Auschwitz, do we do we enable students to have an understanding that this is something in, in a certain time and place and contextualize it within that history? And then this kind of this really lazy, sloppy appropriation that let's let's appropriate the Holocaust and Auschwitz because we want to talk about slavery. You know, how are those two things in the same category? And I think that there's a risk that when we, you know, in trying to introduce complexity in a cross curricular approach, that actually sometimes um, educators, uh, or, or if not educators, then children in their understanding mix up those things and start mm. to complete things. You know, I think I've been to Auschwitz. Well, you haven't been to Auschwitz. You've learned what Auschwitz is like now as a memorial site telling the story there. Um, I think I under, sorry, that's my telephone. Um, <laughs> I think uh, no one calls me on the landline. Um, I think, I think I understand uh, slavery because I've learned about the Holocaust. Well, you don't. Okay. 
Um, I'll, I'll mute you for a second. You. <laughs> um, just before we close, I just noticed one more comment that I wanted to read aloud. This is from Ruth Deitch. Thank you for submitting this. It says, to my mind, anti-Semitism and its causes should be central to Holocaust education. It is rarely, if ever, mentioned. Well, that may be, uh, you know, classroom by classroom, but generalized, quote, hate lessons won't do it. And I think that point is, is very true, that there is a risk of the Holocaust becoming, um, you know, for lack of a better term, de-Jewified, um, which is to take what the Holocaust actually was, which was the, you know, the genocide of European Jews uh, out of that story for some sort of educational convenience or something on the part of teachers. Probably very well intentioned, but I think it's very important to, um, that, that we don't let that slip too far in, in a particular direction. So thank you for that comment. Um, okay, I promised that this would be an hour long session and of course we have gone over. I thank everyone for their, their patience and I also want to uh, greatly thank our, um, our panelists. So thank you to uh, Jen Chardelli, Kat Kirkland, Ruth Ann Langa, and Alistair Richardson. I'm going to unmute all so we can have a, a, a round of applause. Probably won't sound very good. Thank you. <laughs> Um, there we go. Um, Hi, Eva. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all once again for, for joining us. We will be back next Wednesday for our, the second part of this series, which will focus on museums, memorials, and archives in the UK. So I hope that you can make that. And um, do continue this conversation on Twitter. We're at the AJR underscore if you want to do hashtag TLH UK, teaching and learning about the Holocaust in the UK. Um, I would really love to just, you know, hear your reactions to this conversation and, and continue to, uh, to have that debate and the conversation ongoing. So thanks again to everyone and see you online again soon, hopefully in person soon. <laughs>